All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is, my name is Adam Nawalski. I'm going to be calling to order the Summer Flounder Scope and Block Seabass Management Board, meeting jointly with the Mid-Atlantic Council by a webinar. Uh, taking a look at the roster of names here on board, most of you were connected here this morning, uh, but I do see a quorum both for the council and the board, uh, so we're good to begin. Uh, our first order of business here this afternoon is going to uh, be uh, board consent for approval of the agenda. Uh, there is going to be a proposed change to the agenda, uh, two items. Number one, we intend to complete our business here this afternoon by 4.15. Uh, that would put us an hour over the previous uh, end agenda time. Uh, hopefully everyone can hang in there with us until then, including the public. Uh, but with the consent, that's our intention is to end this uh, meeting by 4.15 today. Uh, additionally, prior to beginning the review of the public comment summary on the public information and scoping document, uh, it's our intention, staff has a uh, one slide presentation and just provide some information to the board and council. A lot of you've been asking uh, about what potential changes there might be to 2020 measures that states could enact as a result of lost harvest. Uh, so that's the proposed changes to the agenda, uh, which brings us to the approval of the agenda. Is there any objection to approving the agenda with those two changes? All right, seeing none, that'll bring us to the second item on the agenda. Uh, second item is the approval of the proceedings from uh, we're going back to is August 2019, right? Or we have, uh, we should be approving something more recent than that, Tony. That's correct, Adam. It's um, because that was the last time it was a commission only meeting. Okay, great. Thanks for that clarification, Dustin. Uh, so that is the approval of the proceedings from the August 2019 meeting that we're looking for consent on. Uh, is there any objection to the approval of the proceedings from that meeting? All right, seeing none, uh, that'll bring us to the first revised agenda item. Uh, it's our intention to keep this uh, to just a few minutes. Uh, I ask staff to put together a very brief slide here that's going to provide some information. Uh, that'll help provide some input on what states might be able to do for the 2020 fishing year, uh, and then also can touch base on some feedback we got from one of our other boards uh, yesterday, the Tautog Management Board that had a recommendation for how to proceed uh, with guidance across all boards. So I'll turn it over to you, Tony. Thanks, Adam. I think Bob is actually going to take this slide. And Maya, this is the time for that one slide to go up. But just the next one, Maya. Just waiting on the slide, Adam. There you go. Hi, Mr. Chairman. It's Bob Beal. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Haven't spoken much today, which is a good thing. Um, just real quickly, you know, it, it is kind of uncertain how we can move forward and make adjustments to recreational fishing opportunities, both private boats and shore based as well as for higher fisheries. But, um, you know, obviously the conversation has started. People want to know what, what they can do. It gets difficult for fisheries that have opened um, and there's some level of fishing going on on the private side. It, it gets a little bit tricky. You know, some some folks have said that, you know, fishing is down because Partially, you know, some ramps are closed, some marinas are closed, some are open, some, you know, due to social distancing, you can't put your normal crew on a boat that you might take out fishing. Your, your, um, you know, families may be out, but normal groups of, you know, half dozen or so folks that fish together a lot can't go out because of they're not in the same family and all sorts of things. So um, there's sort of two different scenarios moving forward. One is what we're calling quote unquote simple conservation equivalency. And this is the idea that if a fishery has not opened or you want to 
keep a fishery closed longer than what's currently been approved by a management management board. You can you can keep your fishery closed, it, you know, with the recognition that only limited amount of fishing is going on anyway right now for all species in some areas. Um, <clears throat> keep your say keep black sea bass fishery closed for a little while a month or so and then you could take those days and move them to the fall season it won't be necessarily a one for one translation because a day in wave three may not be the exact same as a day in wave five or wave six as far as uh average level of landing so you're gonna we're gonna have to be able to work that but that that's sort of the simple scenario where you've got days that were fully closed nobody was fishing no sectors were open you know, for hire or private boats or anything, and you're going to move those closed days to uh, some ratio of days in the fall. So that's kind of what we're calling simpler. The other approach would be <clears throat> to have the technical committee start digging into the data and trying to estimate, you know, how much fishing uh, has changed from what we anticipated when the seasons and bag limits and size limits were uh, established this year. Um, it's going to be a little bit difficult because the APIS sampling, the, the site intercept sampling through MRIP has been sus suspended in essentially all the states. The four higher effort survey, what you hear the FES, um, that's the postcard survey done by MRIP. And that that is going, that's ongoing and we'll get the number of trips that have been taken. So we will have some insight as to what the fishery uh, level of fishing activity is anyway. And then I think, you know, the technical committees We'll have to dig into those sort of on a species by species basis to see what what has happened and what hasn't happened and probably a state by state basis so it won't be won't be a simple thing to do necessarily and there'll probably be some you know proposals that need to be developed by individual states for review by the technical committees um so those are the two different scenarios um adam as you mentioned the tatog management board talked about this yesterday and and they the number of commissioners on that meeting said, hey, you know, maybe better not to do this sort of piecemeal um, across individual species. It may be better to get a, a commission wide strategy or policy together to figure out what we want to do because fishing is limited now and hopefully it's better in the fall. Um, you know, how do we want to tackle that? And I suggested <clears throat> getting the executive committee together. Um, which represents all the states up and down the East Coast and have them initiate the conversation and, and give some feedback to the management boards. Following that, my recommendation, I got a number of texts that said, well, you know what, maybe maybe the executive committee is not necessarily the right venue for the final decision. The, um, the policy board, which is all 45 of our commissioners and the federal services, might be a better venue for that. So I think the best course is actually go ahead and start with the executive committee because of get a smaller group to start the conversation, recommend something to the policy board, have the policy board sign off on it, and then we can decide where we want to go. So that's kind of a long, long answer to your question, Adam. But the the you know, the bottom line is we're gonna to have to work on this over the next couple of months and try to figure it out. It's not gonna be a simple the you know, the fishery's been kind of slow for the last six weeks. We can tack on six weeks uh in the fall. It's gonna be a bit more complex than that. Um so I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Great, thank you very much, Bob. So these two options as they've been presented here would not be meant to be exclusive from one another. Uh, if someone wanted to take proactive action on this first option, uh, it's what I've referred to a number of people uh, that I've had this conversation with is the bird in the hand approach. Uh, that would be pretty straightforward. If you haven't opened the season, uh, have the means to delay the start to that season, you could follow the same policies that you did when those measures were set originally and then pursue adding those days on pretty much immediately. Uh, and then there's going to be ongoing discussion. Uh, we know that at the present time, this board is scheduled to meet again jointly with the council in June. So it would be our hope that the discussion that Bob referenced with regards to uh, executive committee, uh, policy board, hopefully with some input from TC and states, uh, we could have some feedback and some guidance at that point on what next steps would be. So we don't have all the answers here. Uh, I'll open it up to hands for very specific questions. Uh, if there's any specific guidance or a suggestion that someone has 
for consideration by the executive board, policy board, or TC. Uh, it would be helpful to put it out there now, but is certainly not necessary. As we all know, the situation is changing on a daily basis. So whenever you have information available, 4.30 today, tomorrow, next week, bring it forward and we'll do the best we can to integrate it. But this is what the intention is right now for consideration, both what we've heard from the public as well as from managers on how to consider what we've lost so far while maintaining consideration of necessary conservation. This is what we're putting forward uh, at the present time. So do we have any hands uh, for anyone that needs uh, anything specific they would want to offer on this uh, right now? Otherwise, we'll, uh, it's a work in progress. All right, one, uh, I've got Emerson Hasbrook. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yep, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, go yes. ahead. Okay, yep, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think this is, is a good idea, and I would suggest that we pursue this. I would also bring up um, something that I think is relative, or two things that are that are relative to this as well. One is we've got some similar issues taking place on the on the commercial side of things. Um, you know, and I'm thinking of scup in the in the winter one fishery, and we're going to have severe restrictions in the summer fishery for scup. Um, can can we can we account for that somehow you know move some of that winter one up into the summer uh period I, you know i don't know if we can just do that if it's going to need an amendment i don't know what the process is but that leads me to a bigger issue and maybe we can talk about this later in the meeting if you think it's more appropriate then mr chairman is i think we need to initiate some discussion uh, about the possibility of asking NIMS to move unused quota or unused ABC um, from 2020 into 2021. I mean, we're not going to know how things are um, until we get you know through more this year. But right now, um, th there's been hardly anything that's, that's being caught by either the commercial fishery or the recreational fishery. So uh, I think that that some discussion is in order um, about how do we perhaps move some of that to the next fishing year. And the uh, New England Council did just that with sea scallops and ground fish. Um, I think they already have some flexibility in their FMP to do that, but I think uh, uh, we need to look at it similarly. So thanks for that, Emerson. Uh, the uh, council has already taken action on tile fish with regards to requesting some information for rollover. Uh, we're not going to decide anything here today. So what I would ask of all council members, commissioners, uh, if you have specific concerns like the ones you brought forward, uh, get them to council and commission staff. Uh, they'll begin compiling and adding to a list of those issues that they already have, uh, can begin having discussion about ideas on how to address them. Uh, and then I think one of the agenda items on our next board meeting is going to be 2020 issues across the board. All right. Uh, not seeing anything else on this issue. Uh, let's move on to the next agenda item and begin discussion with staff presentation on the public comment summary uh, for the Recreational Commercial Allocation Amendment public information and scoping document. And Emerson, looks like you still have your hand up. If you could put it down, would be great. Thank you. All right, I should have that up on the screen. Um, so thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the review of scoping comments in the advisory panel report on the summer flounder scup and black sea bass commercial recreational allocation amendment. Can everyone see the screen and can you hear me clearly? 
Yes, yes you're good. Thank you. So I'll begin this presentation with a recap of the amendment background and purpose, followed by a review of the scoping comment summary in the advisory panel report. Kylie will then take over to review the FNAT recommendations, and then we can open the floor to board and council discussion. As a reminder to the public stakeholders on the call, this action's purpose is to consider the potential modifications to the allocations of catch or landings between the commercial and recreational sectors for summer flounder, scuff, and black sea bass. This timeline here serves as a reminder of the need for a fast-paced amendment if it is still the Board and Council's desire to implement the amendment by the 2022 fishing year. Following this meeting, the FNET will further develop draft management alternatives for Board and Council feedback in June, and the Council and Board will then approve a range of alternatives for inclusion in the public hearing document at the August meeting. During the course of scoping, Council and Commission staff hosted 11 hearings that were attended by approximately 280 people. Most hearings were well attended, but not all, all attendees provided comments. 98 individuals and 14 organizations provided written, written comments, and some of whom also attended hearings and gave comments in person. We also tried out a new method of uh, putting up the scoping presentation on YouTube, which was well received and received uh, 644 views. This table here provides an overview of all individuals who commented in person and provided written comments. The majority of individuals coming in at 74% are part of the recreational sector. And of those 151 people, 94 individuals identified themselves as private anglers, followed by 43 from the for hire industry. 45 fishermen from the commercial sector provided comments as well. And there was also a small percentage of individuals that didn't identify with either the recreational or commercial sector. So I will present the comment topics in table format. The first column on the left provides a brief overview of the comment topic. The second column pre presents the number of individuals and organizations that commented under that topic. And comments made by three or fewer people that don't pertain to allocation issues were not including in the, in the following summary tables that I'll be presenting. Um, however, it is important to remember that although certain comments are not included in the tables, all comments are in the summary document, which was provided to the board and council uh, through briefing materials. So 35, or sorry, 205 individuals and organizations that provided comments in total. Um, and the percent displayed on the last column there is uh, basically the percent out of um, all the comments on that particular topic. The council and board received comments from 80 individuals and organizations that expressed strong concerns with MRIT data, ranging from general disbelief in the estimates to concerns with specific aspects of the recreational data collection. 32 individuals thought that the recreational sector should have increased accountability to their limits. And ideas for achieving this included overage paybacks, in-season closures, and among others. 20 individuals and organizations thought that additional or improved recreational data should be used in management, and this could include mandatory private angler reporting, tagging systems, mandatory tournament reporting, um, and other ideas. 15 individuals and organizations commented in support of greater use of BTR data, many of whom supported its greater reliability compared to MRIP data. And a few others thought that the for hire fleet should have additional requirements such as VTRs for non-federal vessels, or reinstating did not fish reporting. 58 individuals and organizations commented on potential reallocation approaches. 16 individuals and organizations voiced opposition to updating allocation base years with new data, and reasons for this being that fisheries were fundamentally different than they are now, and the data from the 1980s was very unreliable. In contrast, 10 individuals thought that the allocation should be updated using the base years. 13 people commented that management should consider socioeconomics when making allocation decisions, and 12 uh, people supported looking into non-traditional allocation approaches, such as a needs-based approach or a harvest control role, such as the one put forward by the American Sports Fishing Association in partnership with five other organizations. 
Nine individuals supported a decrease to the commercial allocations, while four individuals spoke in favor of increasing commercial allocations. Eight people supported revising the allocation base years, um, and several ideas for this approach included using years of good stock health or post rebuilding years, and using a long time period or using the most five recent years. Um, and some people even suggested using a 10 year moving average for developing allocation base years. A few people emphasized the need for management to act fast to prevent a drastic restriction on recreational fisheries. And four others commented that allocation should be catch based, which includes discards. We also received a large amount of comments regarding recreational sector separation. 37 uh, individuals and organizations voiced support for separate allocations or measures for the four hire uh, fleet versus private anglers. The most common rationale was that the four hire sector has better catch accounting and account accountability due to the use of VTRs. In contrast, nine people thought that the sector separation should not be implemented or even considered. Six individuals thought that making future allocation changes through frameworks or agenda would be a good idea, uh, which would allow for more frequent review of allocations with a less cumbersome management process, while two individuals opposed this idea. Four people commented that the board and council should reconsider allocations on a regular basis or have dynamic allocations. Nine individuals and organizations supported allocation transfers to help prevent overages from occurring, although several comments added that this shouldn't be allowed if a fishery is overfished. And one comment received opposed this idea. Several individuals supported allocation set-asides to account for private recreational variability in effort and help prevent the need for payback. And a few individuals thought that one sector should be allowed to buy allocation from another sector at the state level while one person at a hearing spoke in opposition to this idea when it was presented. We also received various other allocation related comments. 12 individuals commented that the commercial fishery is well controlled and monitored, and several comments supported the option of basing allocations in pounds or numbers of fish. People also expressed concerns about commercial data, especially regarding discards in the 1980s. And some noted that more people eat fish than fish recreationally, and allocation should account for that. We also received many comments that did not directly relate to the issue of commercial and recreational allocation, but many of them could be categorized into the reoccurring themes. For example, 31 individuals and organizations explained that discards are too high or that they drew issue with the discard mortality rate used for the three species. Many also expressed dissatisfaction with recreational measures specific to summer flounder, often relating to the minimum size limit being too high. And many people also expressed dissatisfaction with recreational management approaches in general, and shared that management has caused a loss of recreational fishing businesses, such as bait and tackle shops and for hire vessels. 15 individuals and organizations commented that commercial vessels are harming the health of the fishery by catching too many fish damaging the habitat or creating too many discards. And similar to the sentiment about loss of recreational businesses, several people shared that management has caused the loss of commercial businesses. There was also an assortment of other concerns discussed as listed under other issues on this slide. So now I'll go into the advisory panel report. The advisory panel met via conference call on April 2nd to review the scoping comments received and provide recommendations to the council and board on issues that should be addressed in this action and also provide recommendations for removing actions that they thought unfit for this action. In all, we had good attendance. Uh, 27 members were in attendance from Massachusetts to North Carolina. The majority of advisors um, in the meeting uh, have no confidence in the Marine Recreational Information Program estimation methodology and the estimates that it produces. One advisor recommended that the National Marine Fisheries Service re-examine NREP and improve its estimation methodology before any allocation actions are taken. Um, several advisors from the commercial industry were in support of status quo, allocations for all three species if NREP must be adopted. 
Only one advisor supported using the revised MRF estimates to generate new allocation percentages, specifically for the summer flounder fishery. And one advisor supported the continuation of the type of catch accounting that happened last year, where the recreational sector isn't penalized for an RHL overage, so long as the acceptable biological catch is not exceeded for a fishery. Several advisors recommended further development of the recreational management reform harvest control rule. They supported the view that the recreational sector's allocation should be considered through the lens of reasonable access and not a specific harvest limit in pounds. One advisor stated that future allocation changes should not be done through a framework or addendum because allocating quota between sectors is a very contentious issue that deserves full public participation through standard amendment processes. One AP member supported implementing the ability to transfer allocation from one sector to another based on a needs basis. And in contrast, one advisor was against allocation transfers because they increased fishing pressure on stocks and they jeopardized their ability to remain at the target level. AP feedback on the for hire and private angler sector separation was mixed. Those who supported it said that the current recreational measures are not working for the for hire fleet and that bag limits must remain high enough to sell trips. Those who opposed for hire and private angler sector separation said that BTR is not always accurate and can't be relied upon because it is in the for hire captain's best interest to underreport catch. Another AT member added that MREP is not accurate enough to develop allocations for the recreational sectors either. Three advisors commented in support of mandatory reporting at all recreational fishing tournaments. And one advisor was concerned that the recreational anglers are still primar primarily fishing on mature female fluke rather than males due to the high minimum size. Um, thinking that this minimum size should be lowered to help reduce fishing pressure on the spawner population. One AP member requested that managers pay greater attention to regional depletion. And at the end of the call, as well as at the beginning of the call, um, AP members shared their concerns about the effects that COVID-19 and social distancing is having on the recreational and commercial fisheries. Several advisors requested that NOAA fisheries take action to economically support fishermen during the crisis. And some advisors said that commercial and recreational measures should be liberalized to promote fishing for all stakeholders. And that's all I have for the public comment summary and AP report. And I'll transfer it over to you, Kali, if you're ready. Okay, I'm all set. Let's see. Um, it should be coming to you now. And while she's getting that up, I'll just extend a word of thanks here for Kylie for jumping in. Uh, Carson was unable, available to uh, do this presentation today. So thank you very much, Kylie, for being able to do it for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sound good from here. Great. So the fishery management, is this a... Uh... Not sure if I my uh, screen is sharing appropriately. If you look at the there you go, okay, that, there you go. Okay, I think I got it now. All right, so the Fishery Management Action Team or FMAT met on April 14th to provide recommendations to the Council and Board on the scope of this action, including some broad categories of alternatives to potentially include. And so they, they discussed some example approaches informed by scoping comments that you all just reviewed from Dustin. So the full FNET summary is also included in your briefing materials. So a few general comments to start. The FMAT briefly discussed a legal case regarding a 2015 reallocation in the Gulf of Mexico for red snapper. And in 2017, a court determined that this reallocation was inconsistent with Madison National Standard 4 for fairness and equity based on the justification provided in the amendment. So that's just a reminder that we need to think through thorough justifications for all of our alternatives and evaluate all of the alternatives for consistency with National Standard 4. So the FMAT also agreed that 
alternatives for both catch and landings based allocations should be developed. We had a little bit of a, this discussion for bluefish, but it's a little bit of a different situation with these, these fisheries. Um, and the pros and cons of each of these approaches should be further explored. So SCUP currently has a catch based allocation, meaning that both landings and dead discards are included in the allocation in the FMP, whereas summer flounder and black sea bass just have landings based allocations. So the percentages in the FMP only apply to the landings portion of the total ABC. And the thinking with catch based allocations is that if discards are included directly in the allocation, there may be a greater incentive for each sector to reduce discards to increase their total allowable landings. So the FMAT noted both of those should be further explored at this stage, potentially as sub alternatives under each allocation approach. So um, this is a, an overview of the broad categories of alternatives that the FMAT discussed that I'll cover in this presentation, some of which have multiple possible sub approaches under them. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to read these, but I'll go into details on, on each of these in the next few slides. The first category is no action, no changes to the existing allocations. The FMAT discussed that, as the Council and Board have discussed a few times, the revised MRF estimates have resulted in much higher recreational catch estimates than those that were used to develop the existing allocations. So that's one of the reasons the Council and Board initiated this action. And keeping status quo allocation percentages does not uh, necessarily mean that management measures for each sector will be able to be kept status quo, particularly for the recreational sector. We are now using the revised MRIP estimates in our recreational management, and because allocations have remained the same, the recreational catch limits that came out of the new assessments incorporating the new data, uh, they did not all increase to the degree that would have been needed to kind of cover that increase in the recreational estimates. So depending on the species, no changes to the current allocation could lead to large reductions needed in the recreational fishery, even for species like scup that, based on the old data, were previously determined to be under harvesting. So this is the issue that was discussed back in December when black sea bass and scup were facing large recreational reductions. However, the council and board decided to keep things status quo for 2020 due to this amendment being developed. And while this was possible for 2020, it might not be possible for 2021 and beyond. So the second approach, the FMAT walked through a few different approaches that fall under a broader category of revised allocation percentages based on revised data or different time series. And I'll explain each of these sub approaches on the following slides. The first uh, option for modified percentage allocations is keeping the existing base years and updating it with revised catch and landings data uh, for the commercial and recreational fisheries. The FMAT noted that there are a lack of reliable discard estimates in some of the earlier base years, particularly for summer flounder and black sea bass where the base years go back earlier. So we might not be able to develop catch based allocations for those species using the existing base years. And we also do plan to look into the reliability of discard estimates over the time series and, and in back into the early years. Updating the existing base years with new data would shift 5% of the summer flounder allocation to the rec fishery, 13% to the recreational fishery for SCUP, and 4% of the black sea bass allocation to the recreational fishery if all of those species stayed within their current either catch or landings based allocation. So depending on the species, this might not prevent the need for near-term restrictions to the recreational measures, particularly for species like black sea bass. The FMAT also acknowledged some scoping comments that noted that the fisheries were very different in the 1980s and 1990s and did support uh, considering the ways that the fisheries have changed over the years since these allocation base years. So the yellow text that I'm going to highlight in kind of each of these slides is sort of the summary of the, the FMAT recommendation for keeping or, or removing each approach. So um, the summary for this approach is that the FMAT recommends keeping this for further development. The second idea for modified allocation percentages includes updating the base years to use more recent years. For example, the last 5, 10, or 15 years of catcher landings, and these examples were suggested in scoping. The FMAT noted that these changes would be fairly substantial shifts in allocation for these species, which may or may not be politically feasible. And in addition, using recent years to define allocations is a little bit confounded by the fact that these are all years when we had the existing allocations in place and the fisheries were 
theoretically constrained by the current allocations, but the FMAT also noted that the commercial fisheries have been generally closer to their allocation in each of these years than the rec fishery, which, as we know, the recreational fishery performance is more difficult to control and relative to their recreational limits has been more variable depending on the species, with some species having consistent overages and some having overages and underages. The FMAT also discussed that using recent years for allocation should be evaluated for bias toward the recreational sector, as was suggested during scoping, and that is partly related to that issue of the difficulty in constraining the recreational fishery in for some species in recent years. But ultimately, the FMAT felt that this approach should be kept for now for further development at this stage. So another approach suggested during scoping was developing revised base years using the five years following the rebuilt declaration for each species. So as with the approach just described, the FMAT noted that these would be fairly substantial shifts in allocation. And we have some similar issues to the previous approach that it relies on base years when the fisheries had those allocations and were theoretically constrained. And then the FMAT also noted in addition, the outcomes of this approach don't really seem to be that much different than using just the recent year's approach discussed in the last slide. So um, one issue particular to black sea bass is that the FMAT noted and a, and a public comment noted that for black sea bass during these post rebuilt years after 2010, um, these may not be appropriate base years for black sea bass given that catch limits at the time did not reflect biomass and there was no accepted assessment during those years. So recreational overages during this time period occurred as the result of high availability and then the commercial fishery was constrained by quotas that in, in retrospect were artificially low. So the FMAT considered removing this option due to some of these factors, particularly the fact that it was so close to the previous approach, but noted that it might be worth further exploring this idea and exploring variations on it, such as using a combination of high and low availability years, and it might be beneficial to map out the trends in biomass for each species over the various rebuilding time periods and pre and post rebuilding time periods for each species. So recommended uh, keeping it for further development for now. Using socioeconomic information was also suggested as a basis for allocations. The FMAT discussed that the council has an ongoing contract for a, a project for summer flounder, which aims to determine which allocations would maximize marginal benefits to the commercial and recreational sectors. And this analysis is currently being updated with revised MREP data. Those results are expected sometime this summer. So this type of evaluation is not available currently for black sea bass or scuffs, so we would have to find different approaches for uh, socioeconomic analysis for these species. So one FMAT member noted that we could possibly use the Northeast Fisheries Science Center input output model for the commercial fishery to evaluate socioeconomic uh, impacts. And then a member of the FMAT was going to check in with the social sciences branch to see what information may be available for the recreational sector and how those could be used in combination to develop alternatives. So we're gonna plan to further explore this. The FMAT recommended keeping this approach uh, for further evaluation for now. Another concept suggested during scoping is allocating in numbers of fish instead of pounds. The FMAT noted this could, in theory, produce different allocation percentages, but it's not clear to the FMAT how this approach would work in terms of its methodology and what the implications would be. And because our overall biomass estimates and catch limits are in weight of fish, it's not really clear to the FMAT how an allocation in numbers of fish would work and whether it would actually have any management advantages over the current method of allocating in pounds. So at some point in the specification setting process, if we did allocate in numbers of fish, we would have to have that conversion from pounds to numbers, which could introduce some additional uncertainty in our specifications process. So um, FMAT members also noted that using numbers of fish is currently used by the technical committee in development of recreational measures and if there are benefits at other points in the process managers could consider whether relying more on on estimates of numbers of fish may be beneficial elsewhere but the fmat didn't really feel it was appropriate to keep in the allocation options for this amendment and recommended removing it from consideration at this time so the third category of approaches discussed 
is an approach that would attempt, this is a little bit complicated, so bear with me, but um, the approach that would attempt to maintain approximately status quo harvest by sector from the most recent year prior to the last assessment updates where the MRIP information was incorporated into those assessments. So assessments incorporating the revised MRIP data were conducted in 2018 for summer flounder and 2019 for scuff and sea bass. And revised catch limits based on those assessments were implemented in the following years. So the idea behind this alternative is basically you would look at landings by sector prior to the catch limit revisions and see what allocations would be necessary to keep these landings approximately status quo. So it would use 2018 and 2019 information as a, as a basis, but would revise the percentage allocated to each sector in the FMP. So it would revise that percentage going forward, and as such, it would not guarantee status quo landings by sector in the long term. So staff looked into whether this is even possible. Based on a preliminary analysis, we found that it would be possible for summer flounder and close but not quite for scuff and sea bass. So we would need some additional manipulation of um, different options for scuff and sea bass. And as a reminder, when the catch limits were revised based on the most recent assessment updates, it did include um, increases for summer flounder and black sea bass of about 50% or more. However, the recreational sector was not able to liberalize due to that transition to the higher MRIP estimates. Um, now that we're fully using those new MRIP estimates. So for SCUP, the ABC actually decreased overall with the new assessment. However, since the commercial SCUP sector has under harvested since 2007, that allowed a little bit more flexibility in making this option almost work for SCUP. In discussing this option, the FMAT indicated that preliminary calculated percentage percentages would represent a substantial modification to the allocations for uh, all three of these species and may not be feasible in the long term. However, this could have some potential as a short-term approach. So the FMAT considered that this might not be viable, uh, but did support further development prior to the next joint meeting to see whether it could be refined into something that could work either as a short or a long-term approach. So the fourth concept is recre recreational sector separation starting with first the idea of full sector separation, which would include separate allocations and accountability for the private angler and the for higher recreational sectors. So as discussed in many scoping comments, the FMAT recognized that there are potential, uh, there are different data sets that we can look at for private recreational and for higher data, including, uh, you know, VTR data. But the FMAT also noted, uh, acknowledged that some stakeholders may not support sector separation if only the MRF data is used in these calculations. But for higher VTR data does have a couple of issues we need to consider, including that it only provides catch in numbers of fish and not weight. And then in addition, VTRs aren't required for some state vessels. So some data may be missing when looking at VTR data. So the FMAT also wanted to highlight for the council and board that under Magnuson, any separate allocations of catch to the for higher sector as either a separate ACL or a separate sub ACL would require the development of separate accountability measures. And perhaps there's something that we could do on more of a target basis rather than a limit basis. And that maybe that wouldn't be required then, but any separate ACL allocation would require separate accountability measures to be developed for each sector. So overall, the FMAT recommended keeping this approach for further development. And then another option for recreational sector separation is separate management measures which is already used in a limited manner in this FMP in state waters. The FMAT did recommend that if it's going to be used consistently going forward, it would be beneficial to develop a transparent policy on how, how it should, these measures should be developed and how each sector should be kept accountable and how measures should be adjusted when necessary. So again, the FMAT noted the same concern with stakeholder buy-in if using uh, primarily MRIP data. And then the FMAT's recommendation at this time is to, to keep this for further development, but it is worth noting that in follow-up conversations, we have confirmed that this approach isn't something that necessarily needs to be uh, taken up through an amendment. It can be done through a framework or addendum or possibly through specifications, depending on the measures considered. So that's, this is something we could consider moving to a separate action at some point if desired. 
The fifth approach discussed by the FNAT is a proposal submitted during scoping by a group of six recreational organizations, and this can be found in the scoping summary document on page 146. So the idea behind this proposal is that allocation would not be defined as a set percentage of the total catch, but instead as a level of access defined by management measures. So recreational allocation would be defined as a specific combination of bag size and season, likely variable by state with some kind of ideal level of recreational access when the stock biomass is high. And as the stock biomass declines, measures would get more restrictive in a stepwise fashion. And then the commercial allocation would similarly be determined based on a generally agreed upon preferred quota levels after considering various market factors, and then quotas would decrease as biomass declines relative to the target. So this is the basic overview of the idea, but there are more uh, nuanced details in the proposal. So on this approach, the FMAT acknowledged that this is a creative way to look at setting measures but the FMAT was not sure at this point that the proposal was really directly related to the allocation between commercial and recreational fisheries, at least as it's currently described. So as it's currently described, it seems to be a little bit more relevant to the recreational measures setting process and might be more appropriate for a separate action, such as the ongoing recreational reform initiative. So one really important issue that the FMAT highlighted was it doesn't seem like this approach as described would be necessarily feasible under the current Magnuson requirements for catch limits and accountability measures, because it's unlikely that we can sort of redefine allocation as a set of management measures, unless that set of management measures is associated with a projected level of catch. So Magnuson requires catch limits in pounds or fish. So we would need to do quite a bit of analysis to determine what the projected catch is associated with different combinations of measures. And as we know from our rec measures process, catch can vary under the same measures from year to year. So this could be really uncertain and kind of complicated. So the FMA ultimately supports further exploration of the concept at this stage, but noted that they do have reservations with the approach and noted that we, we do need additional thought into this to determine whether it can be made more directly applicable to commercial recreational allocation and whether it's feasible under our existing legal requirements. The sixth issue was recreational accountability alternatives. And although this concept was raised frequently during scoping, there were not a lot of specific suggestions of how to improve recreational accountability, except for the general ideas of more frequent overage paybacks and bringing back in-season closures. So the FMAT discussed that these two items would largely be a reversal of policies that were adopted in recent years to address issues with the uncertainty and the timeliness of the recreational data, and specifically a reversal of some of the actions taken through the Council's 2013 Omnibus Recreational Accountability Amendment. So the FMAT stated that there could be ways to incorporate aspects of accountability into some of our allocation alternatives we develop in this action, but major these sort of major changes to the accountability measures including in-season measures and paybacks uh, that would potentially be a broader scope and would potentially delay the development of this action the seventh issue is recreational catch accounting so examples of improved rec catch accounting uh, suggested through scoping things like mandatory private angler reporting mandatory tournament reporting VTRs for all state for higher vessels, reinstating did not fish reports on recreational VTR requirements. So some of these ideas could theoretically reduce the uncertainties in the recreational data, but this is uh, a, bit, a big ask in some of these elements. Uh, they do have trade-offs associated with increasing the reporting burden on a very large number of private anglers and also trade-offs with enforceability and, and compliance challenges. So the FMAT noted that we do need to think about what is realistic within the scope of this action if the Council and Board want to keep this to their, their intended timeline and action purpose. So the FMAT recommended that potentially more minor changes to recreational catch accounting could be considered for further development, but overall the FMAT believes that major initiatives to modify the entire system of, of catch accounting are beyond the scope of this action as the FMAT understands it and could substantially delay the, the amendment timeline. So the eighth approach discussed was development of dynamic 
allocation out approaches and consideration of options for future revisions, things like moving average approaches, trigger mechanisms, and allowing for allocations to be changed through a framework or addendum process rather than through an amendment. So regarding a trigger approach, that would allocate catch in a certain manner up to a specified uh, ABC level and allocate differently above that specified ABC trigger. This could help uh, address the issue that it's more difficult to constrain the recreational fishery in times of high availability. And the FMAT recommended further exploring this issue for the, the next meeting. And in uh, discussing the issue of future modifications to, alloc to allocations, the FMAT noted that frameworks and addenda are more expedient processes, but this comes at the expense of reduced public input opportunities. So managers could also consider allowing modifications through frameworks or addenda, possibly only for temporary adjustments if desired. And then the FMAT also noted that we could always have the option of doing an amendment instead of a framework or addendum if you so choose. And allowing for frameworks and addenda could potentially be a useful tool in the toolbox for more minor changes. So overall, they were supportive of leaving this option in for further development. And then finally, the last issue was allocation transfers and set-asides. Again, this is something that the ideas in here are a little bit more vague, and there were not a lot of specifics suggested uh, during scoping. So the FMAT discussed that allowing transfers between sectors, which is not currently in place in this FMP could reduce the chances of under harvesting by some sectors and support of keeping this issue for at least uh, taking a further look at. And then another idea suggested during scoping was to allow one sector to buy allocation from another sector, specifically the for hire and commercial sectors being able to buy quota from each other. The FMAT noted that there is currently not the infrastructure to manage this type of system. And there would be a lot of complications with the, this approach, and they did they did not recommend further development of this idea. Another uh, option discussed was set asides um, or allowing allocation to be set aside basically during the specifications process with a to be determined process for how it would be used as needed later in the year by one or both sectors. So um, in addition to not really being fully clear on how this would work, the FMAT noted some uh, equity, potential equity concerns with this approach as it could be that this is more likely to be used by the recreational fisheries, which are not generally as easily held to their limits. So it's also um, not clear how this would work in practice, but for now, the FMAT recommended keeping the concept for further development. And this is, a, this is an area where we would sort of welcome some suggestions on how, how such a system might work. So that's it for specific approaches. Uh, a few other considerations to note for this amendment in general. First, there is a trade-off with this action between the quantity and complexity of alternatives that we can consider and the plan amendment timeline. So staff in the FMET have thought very hard about this timeline that's outlined in our current action plan in the briefing materials. And this was given the need for a fast track amendment as indicated by the council and board to address some of the pressing implications of the MRIP revisions. And the current timeline has approval of a range of alternatives this August, approval of a public hearing document in December, and an expected implementation date of January 1st, 2022. So the number, the current number and complexity of the approaches contained in the list we just covered poses challenges for meeting this timeline. And I will say that the FMAT recommendations we're more focused on the concepts themselves rather than on the, the timeline issues. So I just want to remind folks that, um, you know, the earlier the council and board can narrow the range of approaches to be considered, the more thoroughly we will be able to consider the remaining options to address the amendment objective. And then related to that point, there are some issues in the list, as I mentioned, that could be addressed through separate processes if the council and board still want to pursue them. And another point discussed by staff following the FMAT call was that we recognize that not all of these approaches would necessarily work for all species. So as we refine these ideas, we do expect species specific approaches to emerge if the council and board are supportive of, of organizing the alternatives that way. And then finally, while the FMAT didn't explicitly discuss this, staff have had some discussions about how phase in approaches could be developed if there are um, more major changes to allocations if, if necessary. So coming back to the main decision points, the objective for the council and board is to define the, the scope of the action and recommend 
broad categories of alternatives for further development or removal from this action. So based on that feedback, after today, the FMAP will begin developing more specific draft alternatives for consideration at the joint June meeting, which has recently been moved to a webinar. So on the following few slides for discussion, I, I do have tables that are similar to the, the summary table in the FMAP uh, meeting report, which kind of highlight the, the main ideas and the FMAP recommendations. So we can kind of keep these, these three slides with all nine issues to walk through as we move through this discussion. So that's it for the presentation uh, that I have at this time and happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much uh, to staff for presenting that. Uh, lots of information here. Uh, so the process we're gonna follow is we'll next open it up to council and the board uh, for questions specific to uh, the public hearings, uh, the AP report or the FMAP. We will then pull up these uh, slides that have these nine categories on them will ask the question for each of the nine categories uh, if there is a desire to remove it. In most cases, we have a summary of the FMAT recommendation in front of us. It'll be my hope that we can do those by consent. Anything that we do not remove today would be left in uh, and would come back to this joint bodies in June uh, for some more discussion. I think there was a lot of discussion uh, during the Bluefish call on some of the topics, that there were questions about whether those items would ultimately be part of uh, the final range of alternatives and ultimately a public hearing document, uh, but there was support for leaving some things in. Uh, there may be similar level of uh, concern about certain items, but a willingness to leave them in to give them some time for some additional development. So with that, we've got an hour and 20 minutes uh, to go through these. So let's start with any questions that are specific about the public hearing process, the AP summary, or what we've heard from the FMAT, knowing that we're going to come to each one of these topics for some more discussion. All right, so it looks like everybody wants to get right to the discussion here uh, without uh, substantive questions. So that's a tip of the hat to staff for doing a great job presenting things here. Uh, certainly as we as each topic comes up, if there is a specific question to ask, uh, we can do that. Uh, so, uh, Let's start going through these then. The first item here is a no action status quo that needs to remain in the document. Uh, so there's no discussion to be had here. Uh, Kylie, Dustin, would it be your preference here to tackle a category in its entirety? Uh, or do you want to focus on one approach at a time? What, what, what's going to be easier for the two of you uh, to respond? Um, I would say that some of these are more closely related than others. So I think looking at category two, the first three are more related. They're basically changing the, uh, the data or the base years, and then the socioeconomic and numbers and pounds are a little bit of different concepts. So maybe we could group the first three together. Okay. So we'll start things, with the first. Yeah. Go ahead. And then for um, for other issues, things like se sector separation, I think can be discussed together. And yeah, I think okay, I think that's it. Okay, well, we'll start with the first couple here then as a large approach. Uh, so we've got the category here, revised percentages based on different data or time series. Uh, as a result of the public hearings, uh, there were five different approaches that were drafted. The FMAT recommendation is to keep four in for further development and remove one from further consideration. So I would open it up to the board and the council for discussion on this. 
Uh, again, it's my hope that we can do these by consent, uh, with consent being to do things according to the FMAT recommendation. Uh, if not, make a case for something otherwise. Uh, two people I've got. Uh, with hands up so far are Eric Reed and Emerson Hasbrook. I'll just ask that when you go ahead and start speaking, please put your hand down and remember to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, well, I'm I'm glad you have the, have the desire to get right to work, but I, I have a a question. Uh, if you look at the public comments, 98 people supported some modification to allocation, but 81 people have strong concerns about MRIP. So my, my concern is addressing the 81 comments in this entire action. Uh, at what point do we have the discussion about honoring the public's comments, the 81 comments about this, the data collection system and other issues with the recreational fishery as a whole. I don't know if uh, we have that discussion before we go through all these alternatives or after, but we have to have that conversation in order to honor the public's comments. And, uh, you know, we have some serious issues that have been identified by the public. Of course, we know most of them already. But I'm, I'm very concerned that we're going to move ahead with all these options without addressing the shortfalls in the recreational fishery as a whole. So I, I'd like to know your timeline on that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Well, I don't think the timeline belongs to me, Eric. I think the timeline belongs to the council and uh, the board here. Uh, these are options that have been brought forward uh, most all have some reliance on recreational catch data, largely generated by MRIP or its predecessor, uh, with some consideration of VTR data. Uh, I would bring it back to the council and the board here with regards to how you want to address these things, or as staff have said, is there a specific need to bring forth another option that addresses that concern. Uh, there's at least one option in these range of categories uh, that offers a different approach. Uh, perhaps there would be support for that uh, in your consideration, but I think ultimately, uh, look, we've had many, many, many hours of discussion about the merits of MRIP and its use. And now it's the opportunity for the board and the council to pick which options they want to use moving forward uh, on that. Uh, I don't want to get into a long discussion about the merits of EMRA because we've been through that. It comes down to which of these options do you think use EMRA the best and which don't? And that's the recommendation I, I think that's most suitable moving forward. Uh, next, I had Emerson Hasbrook, then Justin Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I, I didn't raise this before when you asked if there were any questions for Dustin and, and Kylie, but I was trying to get my, my thoughts together. It's such an extensive um, presentation. So I, I do have a couple of questions, and in a way, they're somewhat related. Um, to what Eric just raised. So, on the on the on the public comments, all right. If I'm looking at tables, I'm looking at table three under under public comments. Um, there were 47 percent of the total comments on this on the topic for support allocation changes versus support no allocation changes for status quo. 47 percent um supported allocation changes 23 percent did not so that adds up to 70 percent so um i'm wondering w w what happened to the other 30 percent of respondents for this category and i'm wondering um 
So that's question 1A. Question 1B is only 47% of the people in public comment thought that we even needed to go forward with this, with this amendment. So that raises um, a concern on my part about the effort and energy we're expending on this. And then I also have a comment or a question rather about the AP summary. So I'll, I'll wait till my first two sub questions are answered and then I'll go on to the AP. I can so take on the my first guess is, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, go ahead, Dustin. My guess is the answer is going to be similar to the question I had asked on Bluefish. Uh, my guess is that 47% of the responses supported allocation, 23% didn't, and the other 30% were silent on that question is my guess. But, Dustin, if you've got a different answer, please go ahead. Right. So the total um, or so the percent that's displayed there is um, what percent of people who commented uh, shared that opinion. So um, there's a it's out of like all comments received on any of the topics. Uh, if that makes any sense, it's 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 not like a hundred percent zero sum game between supporting and not supporting that specific um, allocation change or, or, or status quo. It's uh, it's all the percentages displayed in all the tables are just what percent of all comments received voiced that opinion. So the answer, Emerson, is the other 30% didn't chime in on that topic. With regards yeah. to moving forward with this, uh, we know that for the 2020 fishing year, our 2019 harvest on at least the two of their recreational species were significantly above what our 2020 RHL was. Uh, the commission and council made what was ultimately a compelling argument uh, that supported in conjunction with stock status and other questions about the MRIP revisions and how it affected the stock assessment and the fact that we had this document initiated, those were the main arguments that supported status quo measures for 2020. If these bodies do not move forward with this, then we're going to have a discussion about what we do with 2021 later in the year. Well, we're going to have that discussion anyway, but that would be the concern for later in the year. Uh, obviously, when we initiated this document, no one that I know foresaw what we're dealing with right now with reduced effort, reduced harvest. That, that was not part of the discussion. So that just injects a totally another part of the discussion here, uh, but that would be the rationale for moving forward. Uh, if these bodies choose not to move forward with it, I think the uh, service would certainly have a position on it, um, and it might not be too kind to uh, angling communities. Uh, Mike, Luisa, you got your hand up. Do you want to add something as uh, council oh, chair? I had, a, with the board I, had a, I had a second. I had a second question, Adam. If you could come back to me when I first asked my question, I said I had another. So before yep, we lose it. I wanted it. to address those first two issues you brought up first. Let me see if Mike has any feedback here. Uh, we'll come back to you. I still got Justin, and then hopefully we can get back to uh, discussing what's in this document here. Mike? Yeah, yeah. thanks, Adam. Um, I just wanted to Emerson's point. Um, I think one of the things that was lacking in the public hearings, the, the one that I attended in, in Maryland, um, was the you know what happens as a result of doing nothing I, I i don't think that it was made clear um to the audience you know the consequences of doing nothing there there was a lot of um comment i know you know specifically from the hearing that i attended in maryland where um you know folks said oh just kind of leave things alone just kind of let it be but there was no real discussion about what those consequences would be as far as changes. 
And so, you know, the impl um, implications of no action, um, I'm looking at the screen now that, and seeing the, uh, you know, the slide. I, I just, I want to put it on record that, you know, that may not have been discussed. At least it wasn't discussed at the hearing that I attended. Um, it may not have been as pronounced as what it should have been, um, you know, it, it, as far as getting getting feedback. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Uh, so, Emerson, you said you had a uh, second question. Um, yes, yes, I do about the AP. Um, before I ask that, um, you know, in, in reference to what Mike was just saying, we're going to have to address 2021 anyhow, because this this amendment is not going to be ready for what we have to do for for 2021. So we're going to have to have that discussion anyhow. And my question on the AP meeting was, and I listened in on that webinar for the AP meeting, and other than a general displeasure with MRIP, and I know, Mr. Chairman, you said you don't want to get into a discussion about MRIP, and I'm fine with that. But other, uh, on that AP meeting, other than a general displeasure with MRIP, I didn't get a strong sense that anybody really wanted to do much of anything with reallocation. Uh, so that's my question relative to AP. So I'll turn to staff for a characterization of what your thinking is, what the takeaway by staff was about the desire of the public on action on this document. Thanks, Adam, uh, Mr. Chair. I I can agree with Emerson that um, there seemed to be the majority of comments were um, discontent with how MRF is managed and, and the implications for, for management and how we uh, set recreational measures and so on. Um, it was challenging to pull out recommendations from the AP that differed from um, um, displeasure with MRIP. However, there, there were some comments here and there that were helpful and on, on par with uh, developing analysis forward. Um, I don't know if Kylie wants to expand upon that. I don't, yeah, I don't think I have much to add to that. Okay. Uh, and again, the categories that we're trying to get to here for discussion did come from the scoping public hearing process. That's where these came from. They may not have been the majority of comment, but they came out of the process, and that's why we're trying to get to discuss them today. So again, we're trying to get to specifics uh, on the categories here. Hopefully once we get discussion going on the first one, we can keep that going. Uh, I've got Justin Davis and then Tom Fody. And again, if we can have discussion on the categories, that would be helpful. And if staff could put the slide back up on uh, what number two was, that would be helpful. Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I will start real quickly by just noting that I, I couldn't agree with Eric Reed more that we absolutely need to acknowledge the widespread sort of lack of faith in the MRIP estimates and that that I think poses a real sort of crisis for this action generally. I think what the public is looking for from us as managers is to move beyond just sort of acknowledgement of that widespread misgiving and some positive action towards either validating MRIP estimates, providing some corroboration of those, or moving towards approaches for management that don't rely on the MRIP data. And so to bring it back to this slide, 2.4, um, I'm intrigued by the possibility of coming up with an allocation scheme that's based on socioeconomic analyses and that maybe moves us away from the MRIP reliance on the MRIP data but a question to staff, you know, it says here, explore possible data sources. I'm just wondering how feasible is this? I mean, are there ideas about what data sources we would use? Are there models for approaches out there that have been used previously in other fisheries by other management bodies? I think this is a intriguing idea, but given the, you know, the big 
slate of stuff that's proposed right now. Um, if this is something that's likely not going to bear fruit, I would maybe think about removing it as much as I would like to see us explore something that doesn't rely on MRIP. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, I I think this is something we're really going to have to further explore. I don't think we know right now, or the FMET hasn't really gotten into in-depth discussions about what would be available, with the exception of that summer flounder model that we have contracted to which the council board saw the results of back in 2016, but it was using the old MRIP data. We're updating that with the revised MRIP data. That's going to potentially be informative for summer flounder, but for scup and sea bass, I'm not sure exactly what we're going to be able to accomplish with this evaluation in the in the time span of this amendment, but we certainly want to explore what data sources we have available and what other regions have done. And this could potentially be something that, you know, if we know that we could do something along these lines, but it's going to take a while, potentially this could be used as more of a long-term approach with something else um, in, in place, uh, you know, prior to prior to that and, and put that into a, a separate process. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, I got Tom Fody and then John Clark. Yeah, Adam, can you hear me? I can hear you, and hopefully everyone else can too, if I can. Okay, just a simple question. Since I missed the uh, February meeting, I'm I'm trying to get wrap my head around the fact that we were down by 24 percent in recreational participation last year, but we were over on black sea bass and scub, even with a 24 percent reduction in recreational participation. It makes me think about MREPs even more. So, but is is that what I'm hear, hearing? I think the slide with the uh, implications of no action were accurate to uh, with regards to reflecting what MREP offered for 2019 harvest relative to 2020 RHLs, Tom. Okay. That's Again, all I want to Whether we agree or disagree with them is a totally different issue, uh, but that reflects what was generated by Emirates. Yeah, I just couldn't imagine those figures with what I knew about the 2019 season, but now I understand it's on Emirates. Thank you. All right, uh, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I agree with the recommendation from the FMAT to remove 2.5, but my question uh, had to re, uh, had to do with the other options. Uh, some of them, as the report pointed out, will result in pretty large changes in allocations. And the FMAT document mentioned that National Standard 4 case with the red snapper fishery in the Gulf. Uh, the little bit of reading I did on that made it seem like it was a very uh, uh, extreme example of a reallocation, but I was just wondering if there's any guidance that had come out of that that would lead us to know whether some of these uh, reallocations would be something that could be challenged in court or could any, is fairness in the eye of the beholder and any reallocation could be challenged? I fully expect that if we leave something in, John, uh, when we next see this in June, that would be part of the consideration and we may get a different recommendation in June than what we have before us right now. Uh, I'll turn to staff if they have a different opinion of what the next step would be, uh, but that's what I believe how this would move forward. Yes, I think we we will, as we further develop some of these ideas, we are definitely working with with Garfo and, and uh, legal counsel on, you know, issues like that and making sure this is consistent with national standards. We ultimately have to demonstrate that anything the, the council chooses is consistent with all of our national standards. So we will definitely work on exploring that and, and looking at the implications of that case. I think there may have been some fishery specific uh, issues associated with with the red snapper fishery and, and the history of recreational overages and and uh, things like that. So we'll have to explore kind of the the applicability of certain elements of that case to uh, these fisheries. All right. So where we're at is we've got one recommendation 
for keeping these in as offered, 2122323224, one concurrence with removal of 25, and a question mark about whether we should leave 24 in. Uh, so continued discussion and consent towards one of those positions is helpful. Uh, Eric Reed, you got your hand back up again. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, regarding 2.4, um, the report we got back in 2016, um, of course, it found that the, the, the allocation split that we were at this time was was fine. I, I don't think it, it was that was exactly what they said, but that's what they said. But in that analysis, um, one of the things that's included on the, the the recreational sector is willingness to pay. Um, that was was not included in the commercial sector, and I just want to know if that updated analysis that we're going to get in June is going to revisit the willingness to pay of the commercial sector in the fishery. Um, that that will make make some changes where the convergence point of the two sectors will change substantially, at least in my mind. But if it's not included, then I think that the analysis that we're going to get is going to be flawed. Um, that's one of the flaws. But I just I want to know if they're going to include willingness to pay on the commercial sector in their rewrite. Well, I think the answer to that, Eric, is that given the advice we put forward today, that's what they're looking for, recommendations, uh, what we want them to look at. And I believe it's your recommendation to have them look at it, it would be so noted, and if they could, they would do so based on that recommendation. Would, would that be a fair read from staff? Well, so if we're if we're talking specifically about that council, the council contract for summer flounder, I mean, they are, they are well underway in making those updates to it, and they are basically using the same methodology that they used in the 2016 report, just updated with uh, additional data, additional data for both the recreational and commercial fishery. But um, my understanding is that, you know, the willingness to pay element is included for the recreational fishery because that's the data that we have for the recreational fishery. And there are other, um, you know, more concrete economic metrics for the commercial fishery. So if willingness to pay was not included for the commercial fishery in the first round, it would not be in, in this round. Well, I think it absolutely, absolutely should be included, but if they're going to use the same data that they used in the first one, I, I actually am looking forward to that because Rhode Island's share of black sea bass in that paper was 51%. So I guess I could trade off willingness to pay for the commercial sector for that 51% Rhode Island has for black sea bass. Uh, next up, I got the regional administrator, Mike Petney. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just wanted to weigh in briefly on the issue of option uh, 2.5. And I understand the FMAT's recommendation to re to remove this at this time. And I'm not, and I, and I think I, I understand why. I think I, I, I support the idea that it could be very difficult to be setting ABCs and making allocation decisions um, based on numbers rather than pounds. But I'm going to recommend that we keep it in just so that we have the opportunity to talk about um, an idea that I've been thinking about where we manage the recreational fishery uh, via numbers of fish rather than pounds. In other words, one, once we've made the allocation between the commercial and the recreational fishery, however we end up doing that, um, we would manage the recreational ACL, ACT, RHL, in terms of numbers of fish, uh, particularly for uh, determining whether AMs are triggered. And, you know, that may not inherently depend on 2.5, um, but I think the opportunity to have that discussion about how that might work uh, and how that might uh, stem off of how we do the allocation approach um, would benefit from leaving this option in, at least for now. 
Okay, so uh, there's a, a nod towards leaving that option in. Uh, Joe Cimino. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just I want to thank staff as well. I sat through the AP and the FNAC calls, and I did not en envy anyone putting this together, and Kylie did a great job presenting. And then I just wanted to uh, raise my hand quickly to just support uh, what, what Mike just said. Thank you. All right, again, appreciate the comments with guidance towards keeping things in or, or taking them out. Uh, Tom Fody, got your hand up again, uh, hopefully to the point of what to keep in versus take out. And Mike, you've still got your hand up also. So let's go with Tom Fody here next if you've got something additional. Yeah, I, I agree with Mike. The reason I'm agreeing with Mike on this is the fact that because of we raising the size limit, what, what means to the recreational community is success on a trip. And when they go out and catch 30 fish and basically have to throw them all back because they haven't caught a keeper, they, they come home really upset. The other, when we basically look at the catch figures and we look at the pounds of fish, and I've done this a couple of times, analyzed when we were back, you know, in the 80s or uh, the 90s even, we were looking at 1.3 pounds, 1.2 pounds for an average size summer flounder going home when we got 14 inches. When we started going to this big status, we started getting less and less fish and bigger fish. So really we're having is less success among the anglers. A few people are going home with big fish. And that means a lot of people are disappointed. And that's the frustration you hear when you go out to public hearings is that they're not taking home fish to eat. And unlike striped bass, which is a catch and release fishery, the way it basically is promulgated, summer flounder was never a catch and release fishery. It's catch and eat. And that's the frustration here. And anything we can do to basically get to the point where we can get at least give a better success rate than we have per uh, per trip, then less than like, I think it's down to 8.8, .8, excuse me, 0.8 fish per trip, that would be helpful in making some, alleviating some of the concerns of the recreational sector. Okay, and this um, is kind of a response to these questions whenever is appropriate, Adam, thank you. No, go ahead, Kylie. Um, yeah, I, I, so I, I understand that um, that idea of keeping that to to explore managing the recreational fishery in numbers of fish, and to a certain extent, we already do develop recreational measures in numbers of fish on the commission's technical side when we come up with um, state measures. Um, but I guess I'm just not clear on you know what to take back to the FMAT in terms of how exactly that is connected to the allocation in numbers of pounds. I, I don't really see the need to necessarily keep this in this action that's specific to commercial recreational allocation in order to apply management in numbers of fish to the recreational fishery, if that makes sense. Well, I'm going to look what would usually be to my right and say, uh, Mike Petney, if you could go ahead and chime in on that, that'd be great. And Tom, if you could put your hand down, thanks. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I understand, um, you know, Kylie's point that, that there are obviously ways to look at this. I guess I was thinking uh, a little bit more broadly that if, if 2.5 stays in there, then it kind of pr provides a vector or, a, or a, um, a basis for the FMAT and, and the AP to have a conversation about allocating, about the allocation to the recreational sector being in numbers of fish rather than in pounds. Now, I, I recognize that that creates some, you know, a chicken, almost like a chicken and the egg problem in terms of how do you get that allocation in numbers if you're starting with pounds at the, and, and allocating the commercial fishery pounds. But, but that, that nuance, that, that trick of trying to get there is why I think leaving this in for now provides, um, an avenue for us to have a conversation and to kind of delve into that issue and try to come up with some solutions to see if those will be workable. Kylie, is that helpful? Yeah, I think so. I, I yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily know if if that needs to go through an amendment because I think we could take our existing either rec ACLs or RHLs and convert them to numbers, but you know, perhaps it does. Perhaps it needs a little bit of further discussion by the FMAT. So um, yeah, I guess that, that helps things. So uh, 
what I see would occur over the next six weeks prior to the June meeting is, and we're going to come up to a number of other ideas that the FMAT has already identified as may not be appropriate in this amendment. What I would hope could happen if we choose as a body to leave those in is that there could be some more refined suggestion from the FMAT leading to June what the alternative venue for that item would be. And this may fall into that category whereby you do a little bit more work with it. You say, tell us, we don't recommend, we did some more work. Here's what we recommend as the appropriate venue if you choose not to pursue it in the allocation amendment. So that's what I perceive as the benefit as deciding to leave things in over the next six weeks. So where I'm at is, is there anyone from the board or council at this point that wants to speak in opposition to leaving all five of these items in? I haven't heard much debate regarding 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3. Uh, anyone having a difference of opinion about leaving those in? Uh, with regards to 2.4, I haven't heard anybody speak against it. There's been some questions in it, and we've had three speakers in a row that spoke in favor of leaving 2.5 in. So is there anyone right now that wants to speak against any one of these remaining in until we hear back from J in June? All right, I'm not seeing any hands raised. Uh, all right, so the consensus from the board and the council is to leave these five items in, again, for the FMAT to continue to look at with coming back to us with some more development in June or some alternative venue that they would propose for it. All right, let's go on to the next slide. Uh, category three. All right, allocations to maintain status quo harvest by sector. Uh, no sub approaches identified at this point. Uh, the FMAT recommendation is to keep for further development. Uh, recommendation from the board and council about any opposition to keeping this in for further development. Seeing no opposition or additional discussion, we'll leave this in for further development. Next item, category four, recreational sector separation. We heard comments that broke this down into two separate approaches, one that would provide allocations for hire versus private, second, which would break it down uh, just with separate management measures. Uh, I think this group had, well, we had substantial discussion about this topic this morning uh, and into the afternoon on Bluefish. Uh, I expect a lot of the discussion would be similar. Uh, the FMAT recommendation is to keep both in for right now. So let me hear from anyone who wants to speak on these topics and or oppose the recommendation of the FMAT of looking at these for further development. Tom Fody and then Tony Delernia. I have no problem, I, even though I don't support separate, uh, separate uh, sector separation, I have never had, I thought we always should stay in the same, recreational is recreational. I have no problem keeping this out to go out to get the, what the public wants to do on this. I think it needs further uh, further research, and I think it's good for bring this out to the public, regardless of my feelings on it. Thanks, Tom. 
Tony Delarnia? Yeah, I would uh, – thanks, Adam. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would leave it in uh, for many of the reasons that I, I stated this morning. Also, we have to re – uh, you know, let's remind ourselves, if you're going into a serious sector separation program, you're going to have to have a limited access program for the fire fleet. You're going to have to freeze the number of uh, permits. And is the uh, public or the Fahari community prepared for that? So uh, let's leave it in. Let's have the discussion and let's see where it goes. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Chris Bat Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I might have missed it in the presentation, but think back to uh, when we discussed this for Bluefish. Uh, separate management measures for for hire versus uh, private sector. I think can be done through specifications. So uh, does that need to be part of the amendment in order for that to occur for, for summer flounder, Scott and Black Sea Bass? I'll turn to uh, staff for any specific directives they would need from the board and council to further development based on what we've done in the past or believe we can do presently. Yeah, so um, we can, I mean, I don't know that the federal FMP necessarily directly speaks to this. We have done separate management measures by mode for uh, some of the, the state measures for SCUP and I believe Black Sea So uh, we can do some of this through specifications. I did mention in the presentation that the FMAT recommends that if this is going to be used on a broader scale consistently, that we have some kind of transparent policy for figuring out how to modify the sector specific management measures from year to year and how to keep each sector um, sort of accountable for for their own kind of target or something like that so while the fnet did recommend kind of developing a more comprehensive policy for this it doesn't necessarily need to be um, in an in an amendment it could be done either through a framework or addendum or possibly specifications depending on what degree of changes were made and if I could just tack on, it seems like uh, this has been a broader conversation across management boards, uh, both coming up into TOG, potential implications for striped bass and bluefish as well. So perhaps it would be pertinent to look at it at a bigger scale rather than this particular amendment issue. Yeah, and it is an issue at the board level that the uh, uh, at the commission level where they've taken it up and now have a working group that would look at this on, on a broader scale. Uh, Joe Semino. Uh, thank you. So, I, but isn't this, I, I guess, a question of, you know, whether or not they have separate targets. So an RHL and something else as a possibility, and, and that is different than some of the other options we're talking about. I think as defined right now, really just specific to it's just regarding separate management measures. I think the way that you do that could be done in a couple of different ways. I think you could have sub targets of the RHL or something like that. And that, um, again, would probably be something that we would want to clearly define in some kind of policy. And I think that would be probably appropriate for a framework or addendum. I mean, we'd have to have further discussions on exactly what that would mean. But I don't think it necessarily, unless we're implementing separate allocations with separate ACLs or sub ACLs, I don't think it necessarily requires uh, an amendment. Kylie, well, my characterization, go ahead, Tony. I, I just was, I was under the impression um, from one of the comments that it was, that, Someone is looking for a separate allocation, as in a quota. I don't know if it has to be an ACL or not, but yes, and that was kind of the the idea behind this approach 4.1 separate allocations, meaning there is a specified percent or something in the FMP that says the for higher sector gets this and the private rec sector gets this, and so that. I believe would need an amendment. So we do recommend keeping that for further development. But if it's just the idea of developing separate management measures, we are sort of already doing that to a degree and probably wouldn't rise to the level of an amendment. Was my characterization earlier, Kylie, that choosing to leave something in today uh, could ultimately between now and June 
the FMAT would just clearly define what the alternative management document venue would be if they don't feel it's appropriate in this amendment, like separate measures. Is that fair? Yes, I think that's fair for, for things that are left in. We can further elaborate on them and talk about how to approach each of them, including through separate action. Okay, great. Thank you. So again, by leaving it in, uh, we might have a different answer uh, come June, whether it's in here, but choosing to leave it in today gives the FMAT the opportunity to help define that. Looks like we went backwards on one of the slides here. Uh, so Sorry, Joe Michael. and Tony, I've still got your hands up. I'm not sure if you still wanted to speak. If you did, leave it up. Okay, Joe and Tony are both back down. Uh, I'll go once more to Tom Fody since I don't see any other hands up. Uh, and then at that point, if anybody wants to speak in opposition to leaving these in, please do so. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next item. Tom Fody. Yeah, most of the sector, uh, sector separations were done by states. They allocated in state waters, or they basically put the rules and regulations in. When you did this on Blue, Bluefish Coastwide, you forced New Jersey to do something it had not wanted to do before and put us without any regard to whether it didn't go through our New Jersey Marine Fisheries Council or any of that process. And this is why I think we need to basically really hash this out, because you forced something that maybe New Jersey did not want, but New Jersey had to implement because this was done coastwide on bluefish that had never done be, been before. And when we had it on black sea bass and scup, it was basically done by some of the New England states because that's the way they want it, and some of the southern states because they have sector separations in their states. Other states do not. And if you're going to impose it on the coastwide, then we really need to go through it and figure out how we are going to do it to be transparent and fair and equitable. Thanks, Tom. All right, I'm not seeing any hands in opposition to leaving these in. All right, so that brings us down to the next one, this harvest control rule-based approach. Uh, during public comment, uh, there was a lot of discussion about uh, hope to see something different. Uh, this was one approach that was put forward by some groups uh, that proposed something different. Uh, I'll just take a little bit of liberty as chair and offering in full disclosure that this has been something that I've been working with the groups that submitted this proposal on. Uh, I, I think it's fair to characterize as the words up here clearly say needs additional evaluation to determine whether it addresses purpose. Uh, I think that conversation was very well brought out at the FMAT level. Ultimately, the FMAT decided it was worthy of keeping in development at this time uh, with the idea of they could look at it a little bit more in the coming weeks. Uh, and if they ultimately decided it wasn't appropriate, could provide a different venue. Uh, so the recommendation from the FMAT is to leave it in right now. Uh, is there anyone that wants to speak in opposition to that recommendation or offer further discussion uh, on this item? Got Justin Davis. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll I'll just mention real quick, going back to the comment I made earlier in the meeting about the widespread concerns we heard about MRIP. I think that this approach, while I, I sort of agree, it might be a little bit of a stretch to say that it directly addresses what we envisioned as the original purpose of the amendment. I think this does speak to the concerns we've heard from the public about the instability in the MRIP estimates and that this approach would move us away from managing strictly using MRIP and would hopefully provide a little bit more stability for regulations year to year. Uh, I think it's an intriguing idea and I'd, I'd like to see it explored further. So I'm just speaking in support of leaving it in. Thanks very much, Justin. And you can put your hand down. Great, thank you very much.
so much easier to remember putting your hand down in public when you're sitting around the table with it up in the air. It doesn't, you click the mouse and you forget about it here. So, uh, all right. Anyone else want to speak uh, on this item? Uh, Mike Luisi. Can you hear me, Adam? I can hear you. Okay, thanks. I've been having audio issues. Um, I just want to go on record to say that I fully support uh, the continued efforts in developing this this idea. Um, it's it's the out of the box thinking that I think we all need to spend some time, um, you know, understanding. And you know, I I hope that it it doesn't sound like there's any opposition, but if there is any, um, I would I would suggest holding off at this point, let letting this develop further, um, so we can learn from um, what the FMAT has to say about this idea. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Hopefully, audio troubles are the least of all our troubles today. Uh, Joe Semino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry to jump in again. It's just to the concept of whether or not this could work within the restrictions of Magnuson right now. Um, I fully support this. I'm glad it's staying in. Um, and hopefully down the line, someday we can figure out a, a way that works. But I would like some exploration. Maybe the FMAT can't do it. But, <clears throat> but you know, at, at some level between uh, the council and NIMS staff to, to try and explore how this could even be implemented um within our current restrictions of of limits thanks thanks joe and you can unclick your hand when you get a moment too all right not seeing any other hands up uh let's go on to the next item recreational accountability alternatives uh, this has a little bit of information about it uh, under the approach column. Uh, I believe that would be because staff believes this may have multiple approaches, but just not sure what they all might look like right now. Uh, let me just go back to staff if they could clarify a little bit more what the FMAP recommendation is because it's not entirely clear to me on this slide what the recommendation is before us. Sure. Um, so I think there, the FMAP was a little confused on the recommendation for this because there weren't a lot of specifics suggested in scoping about how to improve recreational accountability, you know, as related to the allocation alternatives with the exception of the idea of more frequent overage paybacks or in-season closure and the FMAT wasn't sure that that would be something that council and board would really want to pursue since it gets away from a lot of the policies that the council and board have, have considered over the, the last few years. So um, I guess the FMAT recommendation is if we are going to sort of pursue this in a way that's not a an upheaval of our current accountability measures, we need a little bit more guidance on how to incorporate accountability into these alternatives. Okay, great, that, that helps clear it up. So where we are with this is that if we want to include this here, uh, then we need to provide some specifics to the FMAT on how to move forward. Uh, Tom Fody, saw your hand up first. Yeah, I have a real problem with this. Unlike the commercial quote, like commercial quotas, we basically know how many fish you can land. When we basically get those fish landed, we basically shut the fishery down, and that's the end of the season. What the recreational community relies on nymphs and the councils and the commissions to put rules in place that keeps us within our quota. So we can't. We're not. This is not because we're poaching. This is not because we're doing anything illegal. We're basically following the rules that have been put out by the commission and the council and the and National Marine Fishery Service to stay within our quota. Now, because you make a bad estimate of what the numbers are, or that you go and reevaluate the MRAP triggers and make all these basic uh, 
out that we basically caught more than we were supposed to catch, not to any fault of the recreational community, not because of any of the ang anglers did this purposely, or the party in charter boats, you're now going to penalize us for following the rules and regulations that you've put in place. Now, I don't know how we explain that to the public. You can't explain it to me. Because if you're supposed to be doing, if we do our job right and set the proper bag limit, size limit, seasons to keep you within your quota, and then we're doing it wrong because we're underestimating what is out there or underestimating what the public is doing, then it's our fault, not the public's fault. And how do we basically make them penalized because we make bad decisions based on the best available data that we had? Thanks, Tom. So what we need for this is if we're going to leave this in, we need to offer specific direction. Uh, Dustin, Kylie, if you don't get specific direction on what to look at here, would that essentially be removal of this item or would the FMAT do anything else still on it if you didn't get specific direction today? Uh, I guess one of the things we could do is develop options for more frequent overage paybacks or in-season closure. And I mean, again, this would be kind of going back to the discussions that um, the Council and Board have had in recent years, and particularly that Council's 2015 Amendment on Recreational Accountability Measures, and, and essentially we would be drafting alternatives that might be a reversal of some of those policies. So that's really the only thing I think I can think of at this point that we would go forward with if we don't get any uh, additional ideas. Not sure if, if Dustin or any other staff have any other uh, thoughts on that. I think that's spot on, Kylie. Seeing as we received um, uh, not too much input on how you know, a new recreational accountability alternatives would look like, all we're forced to do is, is look at what we have in existence, which is frequent overage paybacks or in-season closures, which would be a reversal of recent amendments. And um, just another follow-up on that. The reason why those changes were made was related to data concerns with MRIP and the timeliness of MRIP data and the uncertainty around MRIP data. And those changes were made to address those concerns. And, and none of those um, circumstances around the, those data issues have really changed. So. Okay, so we've got three paths forward. One is explicit direction to remove this item. Path two is silent, which would endorse the FMAT continuing to look at this item with frequent overage pro, pro paybacks or in-season closure as two approaches for development or three for board and council to provide other ways to look at this. I got three hands up so far. We got Nicola Mazur followed by Eric Reed and then Emerson Hasbrook. So we'll go to Nicola first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was raising my hand to try to help move it along and, and recommend uh, removal of this issue from the amendment. Um, I, I don't think we wanna go back to in-season closures, which had widely disparate effects on the states along the coast. Um, I believe we have the accountability measures that we need and it's at the, the board and council's um, discretion at times as to how we apply them. And perhaps at times we, we could do that better. Um, so maybe this is a reminder of that, the, the amount of public comment that we, that we received on this issue. Um, I'd rather the, the FMAT focus its time on uh, further developing something like the harvest control rule as opposed to this. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I I want to leave it in. Um, I'm fumbling with some advice. You know, back to Tom Fody's question, the commercial sector, that's 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 a limited number of participants. The recreational sector, through no fault of their own, is an open access fishery. It can go up, the number of participants can increase or decrease in any given year. So, you know, how do you analyze the number of participants in any given year in the recreational fishery? Uh, do you look at saltwater fishing licenses? 
I mean, I know in Rhode Island, the first year of saltwater fishing licenses, we had 20,000 licenses. The second year, we were well into the 30,000 range. So, you know, you got a lag in data, but you have some idea of what effort is going to be, in which case you would have to set your catch advice based on your anticipated number of entrants in that fishery. It makes it really complicated, and it probably doesn't make it any more screwed up than MRIP, but it is a way forward. But I, I have no desire to see this come out of this document. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So we've got one out, one in so far. Uh, Emerson Hasbrook. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we need to keep this in because we don't know what options we're going to end up with in, in the end of this process. And uh, we may have to have some accountability alternatives in there, depending on, on the different options that we end up with in the other categories. So I think we need to, to keep it in. In terms of recommendations, I'm not sure if I have any recommendations right now, other than, you know, perhaps, you know, how can we have accountability measures within some of the constraints that we already have, right? How do we do that um, other than um, uh, in-season closures? Um, or how can we have accountability measures um, or how do we build accountability measures going forward? Um, I don't know the answer to either of those. Um, also, I mean, an option here could be, yeah, we're going to have accountability measures that kick in the following year, but if we don't exceed the ABC or the ACL, then we don't need to worry about any of it. Uh, I, I think there's things that the FMAC can, can flesh out here for us. Thank you. Well, to, to that point, Emerson, I, we are not without accountability measures for the recreational side. As mandated by Magnuson, there are accountability measures. They are now tied to stock status. They've been refined in the last decade uh, to remove some of the items that were deemed not to have been working as well. So it's not that we're without accountability measures right now. Uh, this is an option that would potentially look at putting additional ones back in uh, and one or more of the items up here on the screen would actually be a reversal of what we've done before. But to be clear, we're not without accountability measures. Uh, so we've got a number of additional hands here. I got Dewey Hemelright, Kate Wilkie, Joe Semino next. Uh, so Dewey, you're up next. And it looks like we need Dewey to unmute himself, which he did. Great. Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah. Uh, on this particular issue, uh, I would be in favor of leaving it in there. And the constituents that I heard from, if it was status quo uh, for the allocation that we presently have, we have enough accountability measures maybe in place. But if it was to change for the future and the allocation was to uh, be given more fish to the recreational industry, uh, there might be something in the future uh, of a way of accounting, a more accountability um, than what we already have. And I don't know what the, what the makeup of that would be, but uh, uh, that was something I would be in favor of leaving it in there. Thank you. Thank you, Dewey. Uh, Kate Wilkie. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I agree with uh, what Emerson and Dewey were just saying. I think that we need to keep this um, piece in right now. And um, depending on what comes out of further analysis of the different options, um, you know, we might need to talk more about accountability and um, how do we build better accountability measures going forward and measures that, that might it make more sense. I think it was Tom Fody um, who was talking about how, you know, uh, recreational fishermen stick to harvest limits and bag limits that the council sets forth and then, um, 
you know, it, it still um, are dinged for for not uh, for going over um, limits. So I I appreciate that and understand it and hope that you know maybe we can find something better going forward. Thanks. Thank you, Kate. Joe Cimino. Thanks, Mr. Chair. In general, I, I really I supported Nicholas' comments. I'd, I'd really like for the FMAT to be working on other things, but knowing that there's an option in here that 78% of the black sea bass would be allocated to the recreational fishery, I don't think we could uh, not have some exploration of accountability alternatives and think that we can still manage an ABC. So I say leave it in. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've still got two hands up, Tom, Fody, and Emerson. Uh, not sure if they were left up or if they want to speak. Do you have something additional to talk about on this topic that hasn't already been discussed? Uh, I'll ask Tom Fody first. I see Emerson put his hand down. No, uh, Do you have anything no. new to add on this, Tom? Well, the first question I asked you today, because I hadn't been at the February meeting, that because even with recreational trips down 24% last year, we, we were such high numbers on black sea bass and scub above. And you said, well, that's what the numbers showed. Now, if you ask me in 2018, when we set the regulations on 2019, I would have said, well, if I knew that we're down by 24%, there is no way in hell we were going over. The same way I said in 2012, because of the Sandy, that we weren't going to go out over in 2013 on summer flounder. And for some under, under reason that beyond my comprehension, we actually caught more fish in April and May in 2012 than we did the year before with half the marinas closed with no boats fishing and everything else. And the answer I got from NIMPS, well, from the MREVS people, they would go at that time, they go, well, you must have better fishermen out there, which was no answer at all. They just laughed. And you know that's when I basically worry about when we, you talk about accountability. We should be accountable for what we do, but we should have some control about what we do also. And since we have no control, we have to listen to the states, to the councils, to the commission, to the NIMS on how we basically fish. What are we supposed to do? And that's my problem with this. I we should be accountable, but we're not account. We don't basically have any control over what we do because you set the size limits, bag limit seasons, and we just have to follow your direction. All right, so we've heard a number of comments. Uh, I would characterize the discussion so far as we've heard more comments in favor of leaving them in, in terms of people that have spoken. Uh, I think I've heard from people that have want, suggested we should take this out that their want is to one of their reasons for wanting to take it out is for focus on other items so if the directive was to leave this in but give the fmat some discretion on where to prioritize this item based on what they've heard so far today what would the comfort level of the board and council be with that if we left today we're going to leave this here but we're going to give the fmat some leeway with how to prioritize it as they move forward I'm not seeing an objection to that or a partial. You want to speak, Nicola, or not? Uh, sure, Adam, thanks. I was just going to say, as someone that recommended removing it, I, I don't oppose to this new approach that you suggested. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Emerson, you want to talk to that specific point? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So. I'm not clear in terms of what your suggestion really means. Does that mean as a as the FMAC gets into the workload here, they kind of leave this toward the end, and then um, if they still have time to look at it, if they run out of time, they won't look at it. 
I'm not comfortable with that. I, w- I want to keep this in as an as, um, as as an action item for them to work on. Adam, this is Kylie. I have a suggestion on the approach. Go ahead, Kylie. So, I mean, I think that, as I mentioned, it would be helpful for the FMET to have more guidance on what this means, but kind of lacking that at, at this meeting. Um, but hearing that folks want it to be further explored, I think we can go into our next FMAT meeting and have the FMAT describe our existing accountability measures and revisit some of the decisions that have been made recently on those and describe why they were made and maybe brainstorm a little bit of ways that we could incorporate accountability into this action without necessarily, we may not be able to develop concrete draft alternatives, but we can provide a little bit more guidance to the council and board on what we're looking at here, what the what the problem is, what decisions have been made recently in the past, and what kind of specific guidance we would need to move forward with alternatives. So we can kind of prepare that for the June meeting, if that makes sense. Emerson, would that address your concern? Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm doing two things at once here <laughs> and couldn't get my microphone turned back on. Um, um, I think that's a good way to move forward and we'll, we'll see uh, where this leads. All right, so the direction to the FMAT would be to uh, uh, just go ahead and clearly say what's been done, what is what exists right now, what's been done in the past, and brainstorm if there's any bridge between those two and they bring that information back to us. All right, any additional discussion? And thank you very much for bringing that, uh, having good discussion on that and bringing that forward. All right, let's jump on to the next slide here. Okay, so again, just let me reset. We're trying to wrap this up here in the next 10 minutes. Uh, with what's up on the screen here, we've got everything's labeled as for further development with one recommendation to remove from consideration. So again, that's the guidance we want to provide here. Uh, so the first topic, recreational catch accounting alternatives, uh, keep for further development is the FMAT recommendation. Major modifications to current catch accounting systems may be likely beyond the intended scope of this action. Uh, does anyone want to speak on this item? Uh, is there anyone that wants to speak in opposition to keeping this in the document? Eric, your hands up in opposition to keeping this in the document? Yeah, I think I'm a little bit out of turn, Adam. I was going to address 9.3. Okay, we'll come back to you. Does staff have any specific questions they want council or board to respond to on this? Or given that there's no objection to keeping it in, does staff feel there's enough meat here for the FMAP presently? I think, Adam, um, some direction on what approach should be taken would be helpful, at least in terms of prioritizing what different considerations there are. There are a number of approaches there in that second column. Um, so identifying which ones are, should be considered for further FMAT analysis could be helpful. Okay, so let's try to get some direction on what of the approaches in column two are people most interested in prioritizing. Chris Batsavage. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Maybe not so much prioritizing uh, or as instead of maybe um, narrowing down, but looking at uh, Category 7 uh, tournament reporting, uh, I guess I'd like to hear from Kylie and uh, Dustin on, you know, what, what kind of bang for a buck are we going to get uh, from tournament reporting in the grand scheme of things? You think about all the fish harvested recreationally, um, what, what, I guess, what, what will that, what kind of information will that gain compared to the, uh, you know, the other um, approaches that you have listed 
uh, under number seven. Yeah, the tournament reporting is a concern we heard in the scoping process from a couple of folks regarding, you know, concern that there are tournaments, I think in particular for summer flounder that are catching a lot of fish that's going unaccounted for somehow. So I think there was a request to further explore that and, and provide um, alternatives to require mandatory reporting for all tournament catch. Chris, based on that answer, does that help you help us with a direction, whether that's something you're definitely interested in? Um, I guess I wouldn't mind maybe hearing more from the FMAT on that. That, just my opinion, it's probably a little lower priority. Um, yeah, you know, just kind of knowing, you know, how many how many black sea bass up and summer flounder are harvested, you know, coastwide recreationally, uh, you know, compared to the, the the tournaments that, you know, just you know, like to hear more about, you know, what 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 we'll gain uh, from that in terms of. Uh, better managing the recreational fishery. But uh, um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Tom Pody. Yeah, to that point, uh, years ago, uh, Bill Holger was at Jersey Coast Inn when he was the head of NIMS, and we started talking about that we were gonna survey everybody in our boat, and that's in our tournament. And that's when we had a thousand boats. And basically we did, we surveyed how, what the bycatch was, how many fish they landed, how many they released, what was the size of the fish, whether they caught dogfish, whether they caught everything else. And we put all our data together and Dr. Eleanor Bahanek basically helped us. And the first year we spent $40,000 putting that information together. Uh, NIMS actually helped pay for half of it. We gave them the data. And basically we continued to do that for four years since Eleanor volunteered her time to do that, but nobody ever used the data. I mean, we put all that information together and nobody, it sat on people's desks. We supplied them with the disk. We kept on doing it on our own for years. So, and that's, you know, the, the problem here is when we do things like that, you need to use the data if we're gonna put it together because there was a lot of time and effort by the community to do that. Now with the fluke tournaments are all a disaster. We've went from a thousand boats to last year, we had 160 boats in the tournament. And the, most of what I can tell you is most of the boats had probably 30 to one ratio about catch and release. So there's information there if you want to use it. And I think most tournaments would basically give you the information freely. But if we do that and we go through all the trouble of making that available, we really want it used or basically what you do. And Bill Hogarth's reason for doing that, he wanted to see it in all species, whether tournaments make a difference in how people fish during that period of time. Do they fish differently than they would on a normal day? So that was the uh, pretense back then of doing it all. And that's, I just figured I owe off you what we, because we did it. We did it for about 10 years and then we stopped doing it because nobody uses the information. Thanks, Tom. So Dustin, Kylie, I don't have any other hands up. So where are you with this issue without any further guidance from the board and council? Adam, this is Caitlin. Um, staff have been chatting off the webinar, but I can chime in a little bit in answering Chris Batsafis's question about um, trying to think about these issues. So I just want to note first that at the FMAP meeting when this was discussed, these came up in the scoping comments from the public. So these were not put forward by the FMAP. Um, and the FMAP did definitely bring up concerns that these are not directly related to allocations, um, but they could, you know, go along with um, some allocation changes if that's the desire of the board and council. But like it was noted in the presentation, they could definitely um, be addressed through other actions. Um, and if, ad if addressed in this action, they might uh, extend our timeline. So what we are looking for is board and council feedback on are any of these issues under recreational catch accounting, um, you know, something that you very much want us to focus on for this amendment. Um, or are there things here that we could remove and think about looking at through other processes or actions? So in the absence of further board and council direction, Caitlin, 
I think what I would offer the FMAT is to bring back to us in June which of these would in fact impact the timeline. Uh, you know, just bring back to us, here are the approaches. We weren't given much more direction. We think we could bring us your recommendation on this range of approaches. Uh, and a definitive word on what it would do to the timeline. Uh, in the absence of additional guidance from the board and council, uh, I think, is that a reasonable request from the FMAT without additional guidance? Yeah, I think I think that's reasonable. And Kylie or Justin, feel free to add. Um, we can definitely just think a little bit more about the timeline and how all of these things added together will impact that. Yeah, I agree. We can we can provide a, a little bit of additional information about what exploring each of these would would mean in the context of this amendment. And during the conversation earlier today on Bluefish, uh, it was offered uh, that if people from the board and council have specific ideas about these moving forward. Uh, this conversation doesn't have to end when we disconnect here. Uh, if there's the, the scope of what the approaches are laid out, they've been presented to the board and the council in a transparent manner to the public. If you have feedback on these approaches, uh, please go ahead and pass those along. Uh, all right, so the next item we've got dynamic allocation approach and options for future revisions. Uh, these are three different approaches offered here. The recommendation from the FMAT is to keep all three approaches in here and uh, open the floor for discussion specific to if there's a request to remove any of these as well as input from staff about is there specific questions you'd need us to answer today? Regarding the dynamic allocation approaches, I think, you know, we would, I'm not sure that we need any specific um, guidance other than um, confirming that we should keep these in the action for all. Okay, I'm not seeing any objection. Last call from the council and board for removing any of these from further development. Okay, that brings us down to item nine, allocation transfers and set-asides. Uh, one is left with a recommendation keep for further development. One is recommended for removal. Uh, and the third one is keep for further development uh, with some concerns about how it might affect sectors differently. So input from board and council on these FMAT recommendations. Uh, Eric, I had you up, you had raised your hand before about it. So I'll go to you first and then I got Joe Semino next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman for remembering me. Um, as far as 9.2, I, I agree that that should come out. 9.3, um, I do not think that should be left in for further development. Uh, I'm not, I don't see the benefit of that. I think it's a, it's, it's not, there's no equity there at all. I just assume put all the fish out on the table right in the beginning. So I, I would say remove 9.3. And as far as 9.1 goes, I'm really not sure what that looks like. Uh, so maybe that would be a reason enough for me to keep it for further development, but I'm very leery of 9.1. So I'll leave it up to my fellow council and commissioners to chime in on that, but uh, I think 9.3 should come out. Thank you, Eric. Joe Smino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're doing a great job here today. Um, I, I support keeping 9.1 in, I think, possibility of annual 
allowances of transfers may be a very useful tool. Uh, for 9.2, would definitely support FMAT recommendation of getting that out of there. 9.3, I have con some concerns about, but if it goes back to some possibility of the recreational accountability, uh, I, ag I agree again with the FMAT. Keep it in for further development. I have the same concerns they want. Thank you, Joe. So uh, we've got keep 9.1 in, remove 9.2 and 9.3 so far. Uh, Tom Pody? Yeah, I would keep 9.1 in. I would take out 9.2 and I would take out 9.3. Okay, another vote for 9.1 in, remove 9.2, 9.3. Uh, Nicola Mazur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is to staff about um, 9.3 and how that differs from um, management uncertainty uh, that is included in the spec specification setting process. Thank you. This is Kylie. My understanding is that so management uncertainty is done on a sector specific basis. It comes off the sector specific annual catch limit to set an annual catch target for each sector. And my understanding of the way that set asides were proposed is that it's taken off of the total catch limit and set aside to be used by one or both sectors later in the year, depending on which sector needs it given certain circumstances. I believe that's the way it was kind of described. And this is, an, again, a, an idea where we don't have a ton of guidance on what exactly it means, but that's my understanding. If I may follow up, Mr. Chair, I would, uh, based on that description, um, you could include me in the, the vote to remove it from the document. Thank you. All right, does anyone want to speak in favor of keeping 9.2 or 9.3 in the document. Okay, seeing no new hands, uh, except Nicholas hand still up. Uh, the recommendation will be then to keep 9.1 in and remove 9.2 and 9.3. All right, with that, uh, have we gone through all of the categories for recommendations about what to keep in for further development? That would be the question to staff. Yes. Okay, uh, let me do this. Let me go out to the public at this point. Okay, if anyone from the public wants to specifically speak towards uh, board and council's recommendations to keeping something in or come out of the document, uh, please raise your hand, give you the opportunity to speak in favor of uh, keeping something in or taking it out. Uh, specifically, I would request if you have a comment that opposes one of the recommended actions that we've had here today. Okay, I'm not seeing anyone from the public that wants to speak on that. So with that, uh, I believe we've completed this agenda item and uh, staff would then take this information back to the FMAT and then we would move forward uh, at the joint meeting. And again, if there's anyone uh, who has input on some of the approaches here that they'd like to pass along. Uh, I think now that we have uh, discussed this here jointly, if there's things they want to pass along directly regarding the approaches as we do with the Bluefish this morning, it would be appropriate to reach out to staff for that. Uh, staff, I'll just ask anything else to come before us on this uh, topic or have we address this agenda item. Not for me.
Okay. All right, the next item on our agenda is any other business to come before the board today? I think we're still connected. Looks like the presentation just got closed. Do we still have connection, everybody? Yeah, I just stopped sharing my screen. Yeah, okay, we're very good. Okay, great. Uh, I've got one hand up here that I didn't see, uh, Ray Bogan. Is your is your comment, Ray, going back to I just unmuted what myself, I apologize. On, yeah, is your comment going back to the allocation amendment or is your comment yes, on other I, business? Yes, I'm for, I think it is. Let me Let me express the issue and then you can tell me whether I'm within the confines and the issue that I wanted to raise was the accountability measure in particular and I just wanted to go, go on ahead. record I'm sorry go ahead Ray okay thank you I wanted to go on record as supporting what Tom was saying earlier and that is that all of you are aware of the severe challenges that have been presented by the data collection systems that have been utilized for many years so i won't reiterate those um the turmoil they've caused and the severe damage to people's livelihoods but what i will also mention is is that 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 is the challenge with any accountability measure to the extent that is in any way tied in to the uncertainty of emrip what many of us recognize and are certain of unfortunately and we've we've unfortunately been proven true on this many times is that the data from MRIP will eventually be be corrected, edited, scrubbed, whatever it may be. And in the meantime, our livelihoods will have been impacted by the preliminary and often incorrect data from MRIP. So in that regard, when it comes to accountability measures, I would respectfully suggest that in order for a body to implement accountability measures, it is incumbent upon them, it is my opinion, to have the appropriate means by which to hold someone to account. At the present time, you do not have an appropriate or accurate enough means by which to do so. I, so I would just wanna go on record as saying respectfully, I heard Dewey's comments and others, and I understand them completely in theory. I just don't agree in practice because of the challenges associated with the data collection process and the and the havoc that they have wreaked over the years thank you thank you ray for joining us today uh all right so is there any other business to come before the board today okay seeing none is there any public comment for any issues that were not on our agenda today All right, seeing and hearing nothing to that end and having completed the agenda as it was approved, uh, this meeting stands adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone.